Belfast today. Over a decade into the current phase of what the Irish call the Troubles. Years that have seen over 2,000 deaths, over 6,000 bomb explosions, over 400 million pounds worth in damages, and a problem which has defied solution. Here, most Protestants, two-thirds of the population, wish to remain in the United Kingdom, while a majority of Catholics, one-third of the population, wish to join the rest of Ireland. There was a time when the whole of Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, before the earlier troubles that led both Catholic and Protestant to rise against British authority. Dublin at the turn of the century. Ireland was a part of a Protestant United Kingdom. The three quarters of the Irish, Catholics, resented this union with Britain. But for the Protestant minority, the British connection gave them a privileged position in Irish society. So when Edward VII visited Dublin in 1903, Protestants would have welcomed him as the symbol of the union from which they benefited. But to Catholics, he would have been the personification of a union that oppressed them. The Catholic Irish, for nearly a century, had been restive under British rule. They sought to be a separate nation. We believe we had a different culture and we had a different, um, different in many ways from the British people. We didn't want to be governed from Whitehall, simply because Whitehall didn't know how to govern us and we knew how to govern ourselves. Nationality is a, is a beautiful thing. And we were nationally minded and we wanted our country for ourselves. Ireland was quite unlike Britain. It was poor, rural, Catholic and Gaelic. Britain was rich, industrial, Protestant and powerful. These people were represented at Westminster and their MPs had to plead the Irish case in a parliament governing an industrial society and a large empire. There was little time for Irish aspirations. However, Gladstone, the liberal leader, had shown concern for Ireland. In 1886, to form a liberal government, he needed the support of the 86 Irish nationalist MPs led by Charles Parnell. Parnell's price was some measure of limited independence for Ireland. So Gladstone took office and introduced a Home Rule Bill. It was defeated. But the question of Irish independence was now a live issue in British politics. It was quite an historic break because it was the first rupture in what had been, since the Act of Union, the total consensus in British domestic politics against tampering with the constitutional provisions of the Union. The Gladstonian conversion to Home Rule in 1886 <coughs> effectively ruptured what had been the British consensus on non-tampering with the constitutional position of Ireland within the Union. It was a major achievement. But home rule was not welcomed everywhere in Ireland. The Protestant minority concentrated in the northeast, around Belfast, a very British-looking industrial city, was extremely apprehensive. Uh, no one really thought that Gladstone would do it, but when, he, when it was announced that he had become converted to home rule for Ireland, of course, the position of the Irish Protestants was again embattled and, and precarious. They felt that uh, independence was at last a practical possibility and that this would mean that they would become a minority in a Catholic-dominated Ireland. Onto the streets they came to demonstrate against the rule. 
the Orange Order, an exclusively Protestant organization dedicated to the maintenance of British connections and Protestant values, led and organized the protest. The people were determined that if necessary, they would fight and fight readily to hold our place here in the United Kingdom as we had been uh, uh, trying to do in the past. We didn't want to be governed by cardinals, popes, or anybody else. We wanted to be under the British government. We felt that we would uh, have the power, would influence the government uh, against bringing in home rule. We in the North did not want it. We Protestants wanted to stay with Britain, and still do. In working-class Belfast, Protestants were concerned for their way of life in a united Ireland dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. Belfast, in any case, had far more in common with Liverpool and Galway. Both were the product of Britain's Industrial Revolution. Belfast was an industrial city. The city of linen mills. And shipyards. From the yards of Harland and Wolfe came the ships that plied trade in the British Empire. The northeast of Ireland was part of the British economy in the sense that the rest of Ireland wasn't. Not only Protestants had come from the countryside to man the new industries, so had Catholics, but they never mixed. As Belfast grew from a small market town to an industrial city of over 300,000 people, Protestants gravitated to East Belfast, Sandy Row, the Shankill and New Lodge. The Catholics to the Short Strand, the markets and the area around the Falls Road, setting the patterns that largely remain to this day. And the antagonism was there too. In nearly every decade of the 19th century, there were sectarian riots in Belfast, the worst in 1886 at the time of the Home Rule Bill. <laughs> Troops had to be called in to part Catholic from Protestant. It was the shape of things to come. Westminster, London, the 6th of February, 1911. King George V opens the British Parliament. Asquith, Prime Minister and leader of the Liberal Party, needed the support of Irish Nationalist MPs to stay in office. John Redmond, leader of the Irish Nationalists, extracted his price for the support of the Irish vote in the House of Commons, a new Home Rule proposal. The measure that was to be put before Parliament was, from the nationalist point of view, modest enough. Ireland would have some control over her own internal affairs. But in Ulster, the reaction was uncompromising. It would not be brooked. The Orange Order marched in protest. 50,000 Ulster men heard their leader, Sir Edward Carson, tell them. We must be prepared the morning home rule passes, ourselves to become responsible for the government of the Protestant province of Ulster. They had staunch allies in the British Conservative Party. Andrew Bonner Law, Conservative Party leader, assured Belfast crowds that the Conservative Party will do all that men can do to defeat a conspiracy as treacherous as had ever been formed against the life of a great nation. 100,000 men had marched to Balmoral outside Belfast to hear the leader of the Conservative Party, the party of law and order, advocate the use of violence. 
For Bonner Law, Home Rule was an exceptional issue, demanding an exceptional response. Bonner Law, the Conservative leader, has the view, really, that what the government is trying to do is to pass an un unconstitutional act, an act which will actually destroy the state itself. But therefore, the government has no right to pass this act. It's not that the opposition hasn't got the right to oppose it by whatever means. The opposition, in fact, is doing its constitutional duty in virtually threatening civil war uh, if this act is carried through. So this is enormously intense opposition, and Bonner Law even goes to the extent of referring to the government as a, a revolutionary committee which has seized upon despotic power by fraud. Uh, almost unbelievable language in the 20th century, language which really hasn't been heard since the English Civil War. At a great demonstration at Venom Palace near Oxford in July, Bonner Law went further. There are things stronger than parliamentary majorities. An attempt were made to deprive these men of their birthright, they would be justified in resisting, by all means in their power, including force. A sensitive nerve had been touched in the conservative mind. The whole image of Britain, its role in history almost, as a dynamic, expanding industrial power, the epicenter of Europeanism, all this is tied up in the concept of the empire, so that the whole British self-image is really at stake when people are thinking about the Union. And that's what the Irish are threatening. They're sticking a knife into this whole assumption that the British way is right. The Irish are saying the British way is wrong for us, and maybe a lot of other people would turn around if the Irish succeeded in this and say the British way is wrong for us as well. And this is a sort of heresy. This was the Indian summer of the British Empire. Empire was the British achievement, the fulfillment of a duty to civilize the world. How could anyone, Indian, African or Irishman, not wish to be associated with such high ideals, such splendid achievements? Home rule implied that for some, there might be a better way than the British way. To question that is to question the quality of British civilization itself. Such was the conservative mind. Belfast, September 1912. More prosaic reasons to resist Home Rule. With Carson, thousands of loyalists marched to sign a covenant affirming their loyalty to king and country. We were very much concerned with the members of the United Kingdom, and uh, I can assure you, uh, I said it as, from a sense of duty. We wanted to stay as we as we had been uh, under Britain with the Imperial Parliament. Our leaders in the beginning saved their name and blood. They cut themselves and saved it that way, and a good many of the men wanted to do the same, but that was taking too long. Carson was the first to sign. We didn't want to force anything on anybody else. We didn't want them to force us to accept Home Rule. We wanted to be left in peace. It was necessary to show the English government that they wanted it maintained and they didn't want any truck for passing it over to an Irish parliament in Dublin. Their signatures pledged them to use any means necessary to defeat Home Rule. And this, of course, implied a wide variety of uh, possibilities outside um, simply um, debating Home Rule in Parliament or allowing Parliament to decide. Uh, and, of course, uh, as a result of the Covenant, the uh, Ulster Volunteer Force was set up in 1913 and organised and grew to 
an extent of about 90,000 men between the ages of 16 and 65. This vigilante army, the Ulster Volunteer Force, seen here at the house of James Craig, Carson's lieutenant, introduced a whole new dimension to the home rule debate. It was clear that the Unionists had not only the will to fight, but were building the organization to make the fight effective. For the moment, they drilled without weapons. In the South, there were demonstrations like this one in County Carlo in support of home rule. But few Irish nationalists understood the significance of events in the North. It was only a bluff, they assured themselves. They didn't take it seriously, and they concentrated their efforts on convincing the British not to take it seriously either, and convincing them to effectively stand by their home rule commitment and to call the Ulster Bluff effectively. But the British government knew that it was serious. Asquith came up with a compromise. Ulster was offered the right to opt out of home rule for six years. It did not placate the Ulster Unionists. They were determined to stay in the United Kingdom forever. Carson was dismissive. A sentence of death with a stay of execution for six years. The marshalling of the Ulster loyalists continued. In London, the cabinet considered reports of an arms build-up in the province. As a precaution, it was decided to augment the British military presence in the north. The navy was ordered to Ireland. But when British officers garrisoned near Dublin got wind of orders to move them up to the north, they made it clear that they would resign rather than move against the Unionists. The plan was quietly dropped. Although one may doubt whether the bulk of the army would, in fact, have disobeyed any legitimate commands which were given to them, this is clearly something which gives the Liberals further pause for thought. It means that Asquith is faced with this terrific opposition one of the weapons by which he might enforce obedience seems to be shaky. And on top of it all, finally, the Ulster Volunteers, the armed organization of the Ulster Protestants, they run in a really formidable number of guns, which transforms them really overnight into a major military force. On the night of the 24th of April, 1914, Nearly 25,000 German guns had been run into Ulster. Now, the Ulster Volunteer Force drilled with rifles and were to be seen guarding Carson amid Belfast crowds. Carson and his deputy Craig now commanded a formidable army. They were absolutely determined to uh, resist home rule and defend the Union in this way, by force of arms. Craig said to Carson that all his plans were ready and that he waited only for a signal from Carson to put them into operation. Well, it revealed very clearly and alarmingly to Redmond and his followers the, the full implications of what Bonner Law had said when he said that there were things more powerful than parliamentary majorities. Uh, that, in fact, the initiative was moving away from the parliamentary context uh, to the, the force or the threat of force. Uh, it revealed quite clearly also how very far down the road of defiance of Parliament and of parliamentary majorities the Ulster Unionists and indeed their, their Conservative allies were prepared to go. The Nationalists in the South had already set up their own people's militia, the Irish Volunteers, seen here marching in Kilkenny. Some 1,500 Mauser rifles had been run into the Port of Hoth. So there were now three armies in Ireland. The Nationalist, the Loyalist, and the British. Civil war seemed inevitable, but greater events were to supervene. Europe at war. Britain and France locked in war with Germany. Would Carson commit the UVF to fight for Britain? All along they had been protesting their loyalty to Britain and to the Empire. They couldn't do other than offer their services in the war. But of course the fear that was at the back of their minds 
was that Asquith and the government might use this to go ahead and implement the bill once the Ulster Volunteer Force no longer existed as that force, but was under the direct control of the army, the trump card had been taken from the Unionist hand. The war dragged on into 1916. Deadlocked. The Allied generals determined to break out. Nearly half a million men were moved to the front. For a week, the guns barked. On the 1st of July, 1916, Amongst the first to go over the top at the Battle of the Somme was the 36th Ulster Division, as the UVF was now known. After a hubbub all day, once it got dusk, nobody knew where the front lines were, and the artillery just had to, had to cease. So they gathered in the wounded from both sides. The next day, that was the 2nd of July, 1916, was a roll call of the battalion. I happened to be present, and only 67 answered their names from about 700. Whole units were wiped out, of course, in the attack. 5,500 casualties out of 9,000 men went over the top. Earlier, you were up against machine guns at short range. It was a ter terrific, stunning, crashing blow. I don't think we'd ever expected anything of the kind. There was hardly a family in Ulster that wasn't affected in some way, either by the loss of fathers or brothers or cousins or relatives of some kind, and really there was a cloud of sorrow over the whole province for not only days, for weeks, but for months afterwards. There was hardly a home in, North, in, in Northern Ireland. I would say Ireland for a country wasn't divided in 1916, but there was hardly a street or a home that didn't lose a father, a brother, or a, a sweetheart. I suppose a lot of uh, fathers and mothers would have said it wasn't worth it. But the men who had, who had undertaken to go and fight for the country felt it was necessary. We had to fight and show that this part of the world was in with the rest of the United Kingdom in being prepared to fight and fight they would do where and when it was necessary. This was a way of saying in unmistakable terms that could be quite clearly understood in England, we are British, and we are a part of Britain and we fight for the United Kingdom to which we belong. But other Irishmen fought for king and country. The British did not conscript in Ireland, but Redmond, leader of the Irish Nationalist Party, felt that it would show good faith to commit the Irish volunteers to the British cause. Such loyalty would assure home rule of a sympathetic hearing after the war. Nobody could say he was, he was slacking or that nationalist Ireland would not support Britain in her hour of peril, and that this, in turn, would be reciprocated by Britain's standing firm on the home rule issue. When the new British Viceroy, Lord Wimborne, arrived in Dublin in 1915, it was to preside over an Ireland divided in its attitude to the European war. Most Irishmen were loyal, but some took the traditional Republican view. 
a war that gave England difficulty was Ireland's opportunity. As the British paraded in the Dublin streets, Republicans were planning rebellion. At the funeral of the Irish Patriot, a Donovan Rosser, revered hero of an earlier rebellion, Irish Republicans were seen to wear uniforms and carry arms. It was an impertinent and impressive show of Republican sentiment. A young Republican, Patrick Pierce, read the traditional oration at the graveside. It pledged an undying hatred of British rule and asserted, life springs from death and from the graves of patriot men and women spring living nations. There was a, a relentless logic about it. They ordered death to the past, to the dead generations, <coughs> effectively to assert Ireland's claim for independence in arms, and to do so at the most opportune moment. England's difficulty being Ireland's opportunity, the traditional line, and what more opportune moment than during a war when England was fully stretched. And there was the additional calculation here, of course, that if Ireland's claim were asserted in arms, during the course of the great European conflict for the rights of small nations, then this would, uh, would stake Ireland's claim to being taken seriously in any post-war reconstruction which would take place. But in a wider context, of course, there was also the fact that the conviction that force alone could achieve things was gaining, certainly, uh, was gaining converts, even in the, in the very confined context of Anglo-Irish relations. Because after all, uh, Carson and Bonner Law had, had preached sedition, had preached subversion and defiance of Parliament, had threatened force, and, and where were they? They were in Lloyd George's coalition cabinet after 1915. There was a certain logic in saying that the only language which was understood and which brought results was force or the threat of force. In Dublin, on Easter Monday, 1916, Pierce led 1,600 men open rebellion and proclaimed an Irish Republic. They sought not victory, but to assert Ireland's right to independence and sacrifice and martyrdom. The British quickly suppressed the rebellion, and Patrick Pierce unconditionally surrendered after six days. With Dublin under martial law, three and a half thousand people were arrested. But it wasn't just the British who saw the rise as an act of treachery at a particularly difficult time. The Easter rebels were marched away to be interned in Britain past hostile Dublin crowds. The men who were being brought away from Dublin to be interned in England in Frongoch and other internment camps or prisons, they were hissed and spat on by the assembled multitude on the streets of Dublin. The people along the road were throwing cabbage stalks and stones at us and spitting at us. Uh, you spit in your face, you know, and uh, call you all kinds of bastards and everything else like that, you know. The ordinary people at that time thought it was a stab in the back when England was fighting for its life that Ireland should rise. Those people were uh, the wives of uh, soldiers serving in France at the time. I suppose they had a, a natural re resentment uh, to the fact that we were fighting the British. During the fighting, 450 people had been killed and over 2,500 injured. British shells had reduced some of the finest Georgian streets in Europe to ruins. Now the leaders must be punished. As the British made safe the shaky ruins of Dublin, the executions began. On May the 3rd, it was Pierce and two others. There was such a stillness in, um, 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 over Dublin. I don't know what it was like in the rest of the country, but in Dublin alone, people, where they used to speak openly before, now are speaking in whispers. They couldn't get over the shock. 
Next day, it was the turn of four more. I think it was the, being long drawn out each morning. People would say, well, were there more executions today? Another was shot the following day. And that changed the whole atmosphere of the, the city. Whatever about the country at that time, it didn't make much difference to the country at all. But to the city of Dublin, those executions were the, the turning point. Three days later, another fall. The final straw was James Connolly, who was shot. Although he was so badly wounded, they thought he'd probably die anyhow. He had to be put on a chair and shot dead. The executions had made martyrs of the Easter rebels. think had a lot to do with the um, with the changing of the, the feeling of the people. This is what started the whole flame. It's from a spark, as Pierce was one of the sparks, Robert Dennis and all these men back from a, a smoldering fire, these little sparks were there and they just wanted to be a breeze to blow them up. Dublin greets the men and women of the East Horizon on their release from British jails. Extreme Republicans before the executions are fated now as Irish patriots. I have never seen Dublin so packed since the before. Some of the men were crying themselves. You know, with joy. I couldn't describe it to you now. It was so joyful and happy. Everyone seemed to be happy. And people were thrown around the round and saying, isn't it wonderful, isn't it wonderful? We've got our men back again. These scenes show the swing in Irish opinion from the constitutional methods of Redmond towards the more direct methods of the Republican Party of Sinn Féin. Now, home rule was not to be enough. We felt, well, here now, they, they were back to start the movement afresh and to reorganize everyone, and that we were really on the way to, to success for, in our generation, we thought. Britain was seeking a negotiated settlement. In the summer of 1917, a convention was meeting at Trinity College, Dublin. But Sinn Féin were not among delegates. For them, Irish freedom was not negotiable. With an important section of Irish opinion absent, the talks were a charade. The Ulster Unionists took a really very um, immovable position. This, along with the abstention of Sinn Féin, the Sinn Féin um, representatives refused to attend the convention at all, boycotted it completely. And these two facts, the intransigence of the Ulster Unionists and the uh, absence of the Sinn Féin representatives, really caused the failure of the conference. It failed because reasonable people, talking to reasonable people, uh, were not going to produce a solution while the unreasonable men effectively held the initiative on both sides. The growing strength of Sinn Féin was made dramatically clear when in 1917 and 1918 they began to win by-elections. Successful candidates like Eamon de Valera were to boycott Westminster. They would only attend an Irish parliament. British government in Ireland was to be simply supplanted. In April 1918, 
the British government, facing defeat in Europe, took powers to conscript in Ireland. Irishmen might now be forced to fight for Britain. Thousands signed a pledge to refuse it. Nothing could have been more inflammatory. All nationalist Ireland united against conscription, and most of it behind Sinn Féin. I remember one big meeting in England, a tremendously big meeting, and this was the priest, and he made us make it during his speech, he made this remark, he said, the right place from a bullet from an Irish rifle is in an English heart. The Catholic Church and the Catholic hierarchy had never sided with the people against the English government. And now for the first time they did. Nobody wanted to fight for Britain. Everybody was against it. It wasn't our war. November 1918, the First World War was over. It had been won without the conscription of a single Irishman. December, a general election. Back in Ireland, many of Sinn Féin's candidates were in prison for their political activities. But the party took the South. Sinn Féin won 73 seats. Lloyd George, the new Prime Minister, would see no Republicans at Westminster. As pledged, they were to set up their own parliament in Dublin. The basic question, of course, was withdrawing legitimacy from the imperial parliament. If elected representatives chose not to legitimize the parliament by attending it, then whatever assembly they were in was the legitimate representative assembly for Ireland. There's nothing very new about this. There always have been illegal assemblies in Ireland. And indeed, of course, the Unionists in 1913 had been on the point of setting up their own provisional government. When they met in the Mansion House, 34 of the elected Sinn Féin members were in prison. The assembly, Doyle Aaron as it was known, reaffirmed the principles of 1916. In the name of the Irish nation, they declared an Irish Republic and their determination to defend it in every way possible. They also began the business building an alternative state bureaucracy. The Minister of Finance, Michael Collins, set about raising a national loan. Here, Republican notables are seen making donations. By 1921, the Doyle had control over much of Ireland's local government and was operating its own law court. The British declared the Doyle illegal. These confused pictures show the British raiding the Sinn Féin office in an attempt to harass those setting up the alternative state. Before British repression, the Doyle and its bureaucracy went underground. But with coercion came a political initiative, the Government of Ireland Act. It was the old home rule idea a parliament in Dublin with important powers reserved to Westminster and to accommodate the North, another in Belfast. The government wanted a Belfast parliament for the nine counties of Ulster, where there was the same number of Protestants, shown in orange, and Catholics, shown in green. The Unionists preferred a six-county state, where Protestants would be the majority. The cabinet acquiesced. Despite the fact that Protestants would hold sway in the Belfast Parliament, many Unionists, seen here protesting outside the House of Commons, remained unhappy with the Home Rule idea. They did not want Home Rule at any price. They wanted to remain forever a part of the United Kingdom. And they wanted, of course, the whole of Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom. But since that was no longer possible, they had to accept the situation which Lloyd George now proposed to impose upon them. And uh, Craig, uh, Sir James Craig, in writing to uh, Lloyd George, actually described it as the supreme sacrifice. He said, we are prepared to make this supreme sacrifice in the interests of peace in Ireland. The Government of Ireland bill, so far as the Doyle was concerned, was to be ignored in its constitutional provisions. They believed that it would not operate, that it could be made uh, effectively abortive. And they concentrated, first of all, in getting the elections going to renew the mandate for the Republic, to participate in the elections in order to renew the mandate for the Republic, and simultaneously to escalate the guerrilla campaign in order to show the British that they meant business and that this solution was not acceptable. 
In the South, troops were a familiar sight. Searches a daily occurrence. The Doyle would need an army to push Britain out of Ireland. As British soldiers policed the streets, the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, was being organized in secret. Its strategy was to render the country ungovernable by demoralizing the army and the police and paralyzing the civil administration. The only tactic against a professional army was guerrilla war. We had the elect government and the British government of occupation. And had their army and their forces there, and we had to establish it in lack of supplies and all that kind of thing. And the only way to do it was guerrilla warfare. Practically on an unarmed body of men fighting uh, one of the biggest empires at that time in the world, armed to the teeth with tanks, guns, and God knows what. There was nothing left to us except uh, guerrilla tactics. It was quite easy for us to do it because the people were ruthless. We had no enemies, only the British forces. During the early stages, like, police barracks were attacked and they were evacuated and at the corner they were evacuated and they were burned. And um, they had to pull back into more or less the stronger centre in the towns and places. Attacks on the Royal Irish Constabulary, the RIC, in the countryside had forced them back into the barracks in the towns. By mid-1920, 55 had been killed, and men were resigning, mainly as a result of threats to their families, at the rate of 200 a month. So the authorities were forced to recruit amongst ex-service men in England. I came back from, uh, from the war, the first war, and, and uh, I thought that anything was better than uh, standing in your queue. There were so many millions out of work. I was deciding to join up the French Foreign Legion and on inquiries I found out the pay was only 10 centimes a day. And then I saw this advertisement in the paper about the uh, Royal Irish Constabulary. Recruits wanted for the RIC with good pay, danger money, prospects of promotion and a pension on the end. So I thought to myself, well, why should I risk my life and perhaps limbs for 10 centimes a day when I joined the RIC and get good money. And then I went, had to go down to Chelsea to um, pass a test, which I did. And the next night uh, I called the train from Houston Station and then I was in Amy Street, Dublin, in the morning. By October 1920, more than 2,000 recruits had arrived to augment the Irish police. Although organised on military lines, they were nominally under police control. What the authorities never really clarified was whether they were to behave like soldiers or policemen. Their mixture of army and police uniforms symbolised their ambivalent role and gave them a nickname, the Black and Tans. As they patrolled the Irish countryside, their enemy was the IRA flying columns. Groups of 20 men or so constantly on the move, attacking them and then melting into the countryside. A roadblock might be ambush. Experience on the Western Front proved irrelevant when dealing with guerrillas, and the fight against an unseen enemy was both bewildering and frustrating. In Ireland, you know, at that time there was the little low walls along the side of the roads. And if you saw one of those, you watched. Because they'd be behind them. And if they dug a trench, you had to stop them. You were in action right away. And when we used to look at them, we saw any pigeons or sparrows flying away from the roofs. We would dive into a doorway. Sometimes you might get a car with not enough protection, you'd be able to lob a grenade in. And all you could do then was say, here, share that amongst you. If we could catch them, we would kill them. If they were on the, uh, actually uh, uh, in the act of laying an ambush, it was a question of them or us. 
we were called by some journalists at the time the fleas and we bit them and the way and came back and bit them again. We weren't, we weren't scared at all. We didn't care about them and as long as there would be a head chance to fight back. And if you can fight back and shoot back, then you feel all right. But it was difficult to shoot back. As killings and ambushes of the police and troops became commonplace, the black and tans began to take reprisals on those they suspected of harboring the rebels. Creameries so crucial to Ireland's dairy economy were wrecked, like this one at Mallow. Houses were sacked and burnt. Suspects were shot. These reprisals convinced the Irish that Britain was unfit to administer Ireland and led them to support the IRA. The Black and Tans are remembered and hated to this day. They just ran through every town and village, and guns at the ready, firing indiscriminately at passers-by, and um, at night, um, breaking into people's houses, taking all the males out and bringing them either to um, the jail or barracks, questioning them and um, searching them. And um, very often took people out and they were never, they didn't come back home again, they were killed. They were a complete lot to themselves. They were given a free hand to do what they liked and they did what they liked. They shot, burned, murdered, beat up, did anything they liked, and they burned Balbriggan and many other Irish towns. The case of Balbriggan, a small seaside town near Dublin, was not untypical. On the 20th of September, 1920, a senior policeman was killed. That night, policemen broke into, looted and burnt four pubs, 49 houses, and a hosiery factory. The morning saw families fleeing their homes. In England, public opinion grew restive. Concerned editorials appeared in the Times. The Sinn Féin strategy of making Ireland ungovernable by Britain was beginning to work. And there was another strategy being employed against the British, the hunger strike. London, 25th October 1920, Brixton Prison. It was so long drawn out. People had no experience of long hunger strikes up to that date. When he passed 40 days, that there was no hope. We were expecting his death from that day. After 74 days, Terence McSweeney died. He'd been the Lord Mayor of Cork and the Commandant of the 1st IRA Cork Brigade. Before his death, he had written, It is not those who can inflict the most, but those that can suffer the most who will conquer. His body was returned to Cork. Thousands attended his funeral. We followed that man's agony until he died. And we weren't alone at that. The whole country were with Tennyson Sweeney in Brixton prison until he died. After McSweeney's death, the atmosphere in Ireland was electric. Here, British forces confront Dublin crowds.
Meanwhile, British Secret Service officers had arrived in Dublin to break the IRA network of informers in the British administration. Word got out that what they call the Carroll Gang had arrived here in Dublin. They were the, the cream of the British intelligence and that they were living in, in the civilian houses all over the city. And needless, we were, I was a soldier, the men that was with me were soldiers. We never asked any questions. We got an order, we carried it out. Whether it was right or wrong, we carried out that order. We went up to the hall door, knocked at the door, and a maid opened the door, and I said, could I see Captain Bennett? Oh, she said, he's in bed, so he's very important, I must see him. We so brought down the two, brought down Bennett down to Ames, and I said that to them, you know your British boys, you know the, the consequences of our caught as a spy, his debt. I said, that's what's going to happen to you two men now, the Lord have mercy on your souls, so the two of them were shot. Along with Bennett and Ames, the bodies of ten other officers shot by the IRA were returned to England with full military honours. On the same day these men died, black and tans had fired into the crowd at the Gaelic football match in Dublin. Twelve people died. It is remembered as Bloody Sunday. In Britain, concern grew, and the army was expressing disquiet about the effect of such reprisals. When Lloyd George inspected the Black and Tans in London, he was presiding over a divided cabinet torn between military repression and conciliation. In Ireland, the actions of these men had seriously eroded British authority and closed Lloyd George's political options. Now it was impossible to satisfy the majority of the Irish with anything less than independence. In May, as the IRA burnt down the British local government office in Dublin, the army was telling the cabinet that a military victory in Ireland would entail full and draconian martial law. This was a prospect at which the cabinet balked. The will to fight in Ireland was fading fast. Punitive policy against the IRA and its supporters had so alienated the Irish people that a military solution was no longer possible. <laughs>